seems to need it, that he's in a band that kind of helps keep him together. But for me, it's always been, you know, from the very, very early days, really, Robert Smith. You know, to the extent on something like The Top, you get the feeling that he did it all. It was all him. You know, this great kind of multi-instrumentalist kind of brilliance that, that, that was the true kind of essence of, of, of this thing he calls the cure, but for me is Smith. I never used to be able to, to put any feelings of optimism or hope or anything into songs. It was always complete despair. Even though my, my actual personality was always quite balanced, or as balanced as it is, you know. But now, I, it, what the cure do tends to reflect a, like a whole more than just one particular piece of... It's more like a group mentality. But yeah, Let's Go To Bed was pro probably the only contrived record we ever made and ever will make because it was designed to completely break the mould of, of what The Cure had become, which I thought was very static and almost stagnant. Robert Smith is The Cure. That's definitely true. And, um, you know, you couldn't imagine The Cure without Robert Smith. But obviously there has been the cure without any other band member you can think of because, you know, uh, apart from the fall, he's probably had more lineup changes of, of any band in history. But I think the key to a successful cure lineup was always whether it was people who were prepared to follow Robert Smith where he wanted to go. He's got a really, as far as I can tell anyway, got a really committed um, approach to making a record that, um, you know, he demands full on commitment from everybody. And if he's going to make a sort of bleak, depressing record, then you know, he wants everybody to be having a bleak, depressing time. If he's making an upbeat uh, pop record, then, you know, he wants everybody to be having an upbeat pop time. So there have been you know, certain members of The Cure that have been really important to that sound. I mean, obviously Lowell Tolhurst, who uh, fell out very badly with Robert Smith eventually and was kicked out of the band, was certainly key to, you know, their early um, stuff and, you know, had a big, had a big impact on the, on the band musically uh, and in terms of certainly their spirit. Um, and it, it went fairly hideously wrong, obviously, in the, in the long run. But um, you can't underestimate the impact of, of all the bit players. And, and the fact that they conquered America is not just down to the fact that Robert Smith wrote brilliant songs. It's because he went out there with a band who could, you know, rock out with the best of them. Because you can't appear in front of 65,000 people, uh, you know, in some uh, barn of a stadium that's used to hold in uh, baseball games, unless your band can rock. I think what always struck me about um, Robert Smith and Cecily uh, when I first met him, you get the impression it's like with his, his, his marriage, his relationship uh, with Mary, he's in something for um, the duration. Um, and I think that's something that, that struck me. I mean, he, he along with a, a lot of other people as well, but it's... It's, it's, it's a career, it's longevity. I think the key to Robert Smith's appeal as a fan is that you're never quite sure where you are with him. He is enigmatic in the very best sense of the word. Um, you know, if you just listened to his records, you'd think he was some sort of uh, lovelorn poet up in his attic, you know, tearing his hair out in despair. But then you read his interviews and you find out that he actually spends a lot of the time, you know, like he's, uh, uh, like he's, I don't know, a footballer, perhaps. He seems to spend all his time, you know, playing football, getting drunk and having a good time. So it's that kind of unique thing that he can be, you know, sort of uh, a, one of the lads and he can be this kind of enigmatic poet figure, which makes him really intriguing as a person. I think one of the things that, that made us sort of fast friends was uh, his sense of humour. He's got a really... Um, a really good sense of humour and that's not something that comes out too often in, in the work that he does and there's no reason why it should. Um, but, you know, you, the public face of somebody isn't, isn't always what, what they're really like. So, um, yeah, I think that's, that's, I think that's key to a lot of creative work is understanding the, the sense of humour and the jokes that you can you can throw in to, you know, um, just sort of soften the blows of, of all the other stuff that you're, you're trying to deal with. We don't sing really about issues that are, that are socially relevant, particularly, so that they're, they're not placed in England. There's a lot of, if you get caught up in singing about 
side of social or political issues in, in England, it tends to alienate a lot of people because they don't understand what he's on. I mean, I don't understand British politics. The thing about Robert Smith's voice is that, on the surface, it's rubbish. <laughs> if he turned up at the Pop Idol audition, they'd, they'd kick him out within, you know, 10 seconds and just tell him he can't sing. Um, and I suppose technically they, they might be right. But wh when it comes to conveying emotion and a range of emotion, then obviously he'll knock any you know, winner of American Idol um, you know, into next week. Because it's really quirky, which is really good, especially in an era when most singers were fairly bland production line, uh, you know, Stock Ake and Waterman type thing. Um, so to hear somebody essentially squawking <laughs> like some kind of mad bird uh, over a record was, you know, was a really refreshing. But he's got a lot of range as well, so he can do kind of dark and doomy, and he can do up and poppy, and be equally convincing on both. And a song like something like Just Like Heaven, for example, if that was sung perfectly, I don't think it would be as good a record as it is. Um, it would just lose something. It would feel like more of a cliché pop record. But in his hands, I think the fact that you know. He's a bit sloppy with it, makes it just, you know, that's the, the missing ingredient that makes it just a, a brilliant record. I think Robert, Robert's got a very distinctive voice. Um, you know it's him immediately. Um, and so, somehow it always seems as though it's, very, it's, it's a very emotive voice. Um, there again, it's, you know, it's, it's a kind of... Uh, People either love it or they don't, um, which is usually a sign of, of, of something that's their good, in my opinion, um, or at least unique. I love the way I can just, uh, uh, there's a kind of, there's a passion in every note, every thing he does, the way he says words, how he phrases, um, and I, it, well, I, you know, the thing that struck me. Uh, most originally was it was the first thing you know sometimes it might be a riff mightn't it uh, and and in the case of Robert Smith it was the voice that is it is vulnerable um, it's got so many different emotions it can be sound paranoid sometimes sound manic um, but you know he, he he pulls off so many different things with the voice it's his best instrument Apart from the very obvious sort of, sort of songwriting and the, and, the, and the singing, I always felt that Robert was a really kind of underrated guitarist. Having seen how he could so easily put life into some of the Banshee's songs which weren't written by him, um, I knew that there was much more to him as a guitar player than, than had really been previously seen. So um, when we came to do the Glove album, I really wanted to sort of push that area of him, and I think he's, I think some of his best guitar playing is on that album, just because I think he just, you know, he wasn't the front person. You know, we were doing it together, and we basically got somebody else in to sing, and so, you know, there was a couple of moments on that album where he really lets loose as a guitarist, and I think it's fantastic. He can play virtually any mood. Um, but one of the great things that he's, he's able to do is create an atmosphere with his guitar playing. I mean, most people can pick up a guitar and strum a few chords, but he's able to, with the tuning, he uses all different kinds of tunings on the guitars as well. So uh, those moods that he's able to create uh, kind of, for my own personal taste, remind me of Joni Mitchell a bit because she uses a lot of different tunings on the guitars. His voice is his calling card. That's the great thing. I mean, <laughs> just like Bob Dylan's voice or, or Johnny Rotten's voice is his calling card, so it is with, uh, with Robert. That and his hair. <coughs> and I think they've been incredibly astute over the years that however far out they've gone from that original Cure sound, the two things that have remained constant are the hair and the, uh, the voice, um, and that's great branding, you know, you've got to have product identification in the modern world of, of marketing and profiling, 